Hi, my name's Bob Grinier, and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. So welcome to 2024! And this is the 7th of January. How is everyone? Hi, Tony Yavoni. Hi, Martin Kemp. Hi, Space Case. Hi, WP for Truth. Hi, Carmen Miller, Nick Moore. Hi, Gordon Doherty. Hi, Dan Moretti. Thank you for your comments. Uh, hi, uh, Simeon Hain. Thank you also for your comments. Uh, thank you to Nick Nock. And, of course, to Artifact is in the house. And Witkowski. Yin Gazda from Austria. Pleasure to have you join us today, FPV Angel. We have a good quorum here, 59 indeed, to start the first presentation of this year, 2024. So, how is everyone? I've got one more graphic that I'm going to just do a screen grab of uh, before I run through this presentation. I probably am quite asleep. Um, I'm still on Asian time, having spent nearly a month over there, um, helping Malcolm Bendel get off the ground in India and also uh, working with Binger and Huang in Taipei. Hyper Nikolai Hockland and the Juggler's assistants, Lucas, Luke Thiered Gould, Ken Pratt. Very good to have you, Cody Ty Taylor and uh, Bob Wildfish, TP Sven, and Kuki Kucha, and Commander Milan, and Craig KB. Wow, we have a good quorum here in the house. And Lena for you, excellent. Paul O'Neill and Toon Peters. Hi, Toon, you finally made it. Excellent. <laughs> All right, let me just... Uh, uh, I've just got to go one screen grab and dump it on the slide and then I'll be pretty much ready to go. So, ah, uh, as ever. Uh, so, uh, th this is actually a presentation I wanted to do for a very long time. It's helped resolve one issue for me um, and it kind of brings things full circle in terms of the structure, in my view, potentially of ball lightning um, although I still have some reservations I think I want to get it out there to open the discussion on whether this could be closer than some things that we had discussed in the past so let me just screen grab this and I'll be in a better position to um, start the presentation talk amongst yourselves what an exciting start to the year. Bin's paper published in the sixth largest journal by distribution, I think. Nature Scientific Reports. And I will actually be talking at the Cosmic Summit 2024. And at some point I will share a um, link where... A small proportion of anyone who wants to go and maybe meet with me and uh, hear me blather on in the flesh um, will go to help support me go there. Um, if you've already bought a ticket to that com Cosmic Summit, then um, let the organisers know that you did it because you wanted to come and see me uh, so that a small proportion of your entry fee will help support me in the work that I do. Okay, so I am going to just do this quickly and uh, we will be in a position to start the presentation. Uh, okay. <laughs> 
What a start to the year. We've got some uh, <laughs> this interesting characters. Uh, mostly it's one guy under a couple of pseudonyms who straight out and wrote to the uh, editors of um, Nature Scientific Reports and tried to uh, cast doubt on the work. And uh, he's a bit of a notorious figure and seems to think that everything should happen exactly as and when he decides it should happen. <laughs> he doesn't quite understand that I'm not the corresponding author. <laughs> I'm just one of the authors. Uh, and uh, seems to get offended that imme immediately his and his uh, cohort uh, desires are not met. <laughs> On a weekend! <laughs> oh dear. Yeah. Anyway... Such is life. Right. Okay, I think we can do this. So, at least we can do something. It's not going to be ideal. You know, that's how I roll sometimes. But get it out of the door. Start a conversation, why not? 88! That's a very, very lucky number in Asia. A very, very lucky number. So, this is Ode Flower of Life. And I guess the first time I really mentioned the flower of life was in my October the 4th, 2018 presentation to the Cold Nuclear Transmutation and Ball Lightning Conference in Sochi in Russia, in the Russian Federation. And the slide that I talked about, or talked to, was this one where on the left hand I had um, this image that is from the Temple of Osiris at Abydos in Egypt and, and no one knows when this was etched or burnt or whatever onto the granite there um, but it is this flower of life type structure and it has this kind of double layer on the outside. And I have seen this in imagery all over the world. And in fact, when I was just 18, I took myself with a friend and another friend on the 33-hour journey, because <laughs> it would be, from Hong Kong to uh, Beijing, where I had the pleasure of visiting the Forbidden Palace. Uh, if you know, don't know, the Tiananmen Square incident uh, happened not that many years before in front of the entrance to the Forbidden Palace in Tiananmen Square, which is actually a very, very big square. And the Forbidden Palace itself, it has a temple in the center. And in that, out just side that uh, central temple, they have these kind of like limestone or marble sort of staircase going up. And either side of that, they have two foo dogs, these kind of like based off ancient Indian temple sort of guardians. And on, if you're looking at the temple door, uh, on the right hand side, that foo dog under its right paw has this spherical structure uh, which is a spherical version of the flower of life in my opinion and I had the pleasure of touching this uh, and contemplating it 33 years ago. <laughs> of course I would, wouldn't I? <laughs> It's all coming together. <laughs> so, um, I think we might be getting close to understanding that, yes, this is a spherical flower of life and that it is potentially um, the structure of the mesh of ball lightning. And I had one go at this a little while ago, but let's see if we can't do a better job. So, uh, 
for those that know, uh, this is my fractal. No, that isn't. I don't know what that is. I think my, my thing's just crashed. <laughs> Not very helpful, is it? <laughs> oh, dear. Right. Yeah, that's very weird. Um, okay, let's try that again. This is my wheel within a wheel. So wheel within a wheel within a wheel. Basic three-level exotic vacuum object. And this was derived from the study of Hutchison material. But at the core of it, you have a magneto-hydrodynamic fractal structure. And one of the first times I saw what appeared to be a hydrodynamic structure was in the sadly departed Nail Crichton Gold's Lion Reactor, one of them, uh, that I disassembled live on camera. And this is actually outside of the core. It had the center of this part of the vortex where the bend in this wire was and there was a geometric storm on the top of here with synthesized calcium in the crystals on here and there was nothing underneath so the flux loop went from this side the smaller side round and splatted down on here and because we can see the vortical things going around this way probably the um, sothic triangle would extend out that way but this is in line with the solenoids uh, magnetic field through the center of the solenoid and we know two things which is very hydrodynamic in nature you have the inner vortex structures like meeting in the center and then these outer ones um, at a distance and also in the lion we saw in the outer crust of the copper oxide um, this kind of black hole as one of the pore prints and this is in my view the magnetic core of the um, exotic vacuum object get my mug shot out of the way and it has this torsion thing going on with the beam that comes down and much later with uh, Amaza we saw this um, uh, yin force and by that I mean it's it's extracting matter at a distance and bringing it in whereas this is a yang force it's kind of destroying matter in the core and projecting it out so that is what i mean by those two terms but anyway the the when i'm referring to this being a hydrodynamic but specifically a magneto hydrodynamic structure i'm kind of referring to these kind of things where you have this inner area where most of the action occurs almost all of the action occurs in this inner area and there's this kind of outer area where there is some uh, loose influence and together this makes the apple when you project that into 3d you know you can see it and i've talked about this in terms of the um you know the cavitation bubble and how that relates to an overall uh spherical bubble in this discharge here and you can see here how different areas in the structure um, are affected differently by the vortical motions in here now when I was talking about the O'Day another dimension I actually went through a whole series of experimental evidence you can go and look at that video and I had derived um, the fractal nature in 3D and also the boundary of the overall structure uh, where this is something that can actually wet together with other ones of these but when you have one of these structures alone it actually makes like a, a spherical structure and this is the non-radiating boundary here from the fractal toroidal structure in the center and one of the pieces of data I used to get to that was work of Metin R on bubble structures in cavitation and I showed how just a basic yin-yang fractal structure uh, lent to, let, led to the depressurization here so there's a depressurization beam that comes back down here okay this caduceus vortex spiral this depressurization here of matter uh, into the yin-yang structure and 
you know, this is a dual spiral. It's a dual spiral. And you can see here the depressurization into this one side and then uh, rotational symmetry here. Again, depressurization out of that. But there is this bleed in and a bleed in, but also sort of a feed round in a loop. Now, in other bubble structures, you can see a more fractal structure here. And out of the center of this, you have this helical thing coming out. You have this helical thing coming out. And in the um, observation on uh, a Omaza vibrator plate from a cavitation spot, we see a helical beam coming out. And this will be relevant later to the structure. And what we have seen in terms of um, spherical versions and toroidal versions. I don't know whether I'm going to get that across sufficiently accurately today. The other aspect with these spherical structures, uh, and we saw on the toroidal structure, uh, on the um, area surrounding the this hemisphere cut out of a copper pipe, um, is that they, they have this kind of like coherent kind of homogeneous skin of a certain thickness and then on the outside they have these crenellations so in my view this is a broken sphere section like like for instance if you could imagine this triangular piece broke off and it flipped over this is what you would be seeing so you have this basically homogeneous layer and then you have these bits bolted on the outside okay and so what are they well um a toroidal structure um, we see here in a Henk urine experiment, and so um, we observe these things uh, in his evacuated tube, and then we bolted a thing on the outside of the reactor, and then we put a copper tube in there, and we ended up with the ability to produce um, these fairly long-lived uh, toroidal clusters with the finger of God descending down the, the, the vortex, feeding the matter and electrons and stuff into the cluster. And because of the exposure here, you don't see the overall sphere. You're actually looking through that outer sphere into the toroidal. And every so often you see a flash. And what's happening with that flash is it's essentially ejecting an EVO of a certain level of cluster size. Um, and they go ahead and they impact into the fused quartz that is covering the anode. So here's the anode here. Uh, and uh, it has this fused quartz sheath around it. And I think here, um, Henk goes in and he looks at a particular structure here. I might have got this ob image over the top um, in, in a place which is not convenient. But anyway, um, he zooms into a structure. Meanwhile, while that's coming in, we've got a four-order structure here, a multi-order structure here. This is kind of like a six and whatever. So this is the structure that I, um, was found on there. It's from a copper pipe. We have a copper-looking like deposit here. And essentially, the non-radiating boundary has this fuzzy bit outside. And we always see these kind of fuzzy bits on the outside. Okay, And what is the fuzzy bits? Well, when we saw the toroidal structure on the outside of this copper hemispherical cut, uh, these were twisted pairs, a series of twisted pairs uh, uh, from the kind of coherent skin layer. And I'll try and attempt to explain what I think those are. Um, you may or may not get it in this presentation, which I'm going to try and keep short. But... Um, I think that's uh, uh, what you'll see is something that may account for what what is observed um, coming out of these structures. Now, one thing I want to say, and as I and I will put this in the blog because I haven't got it prepared, but um, when Leonid Oritskiev, um was part of the Chernobyl cleanup, uh, he did a video which I'm yet to publish um, um, because it's very, very important that the transcription is good and so on as part of the cold nuclear transmutation and ball lightning group. But he saw things in 
and and listen to accounts. So, for instance, in in one account, they were talking about these glowing orbs moving around. Um, obviously, there's illumination with these weird colours, which he explained with the charge clusters, effectively, or what he says is low shack monopoles binding to the oxygen in the air and changing the the electron orbital. Um, position so that you get different spectra coming out from the ionization from ordinary kind of gamma and x-ray radiation um he also talked about the fact that these huge graphite blocks had essentially gone through this massive iron or concrete lid of the reactor and, and flown up in the air and come down but they're very brittle but they weren't broken at all so how, firstly how did they get out and then how did they land down on the ground or on the roof or whatever without breaking and the fact that there was no uranium uh, the, there was nothing melted down it wasn't a china syndrome it's just through the entire reactor all of the graphite blocks which are ultra pure there were synthesized elements smeared through all of the structure of the reactor and he talked about pieces of metal that had somehow come from one part of the reactor got through incredibly small gaps which were in his opinion basically are impossible for these things to come through and they went they were like intersected with each other like that they went you know how, how does a piece of metal intersect with another piece of metal and it, it, very very weird things and because he had no way to explain many many observations of what happened in the chernobyl reactor uh he actually reached out from the mainstream which he was working in to the cold nuclear transmutation and ball lightning kind of research you know fraternity group and he did this study of exploding foils but his his very famous one was uh, titanium foil and what he observed is a massive reduction in 48 titanium and other elements uh, uh, synthesized both heavier and lighter very very key and this is a titanium foil you know a, a, a capacitor discharge makes it explode in water so it will instantaneously be creating a charge separation both in the metal and in the water creating HHO and it will create extreme multi-axis shear in that environment and leading to magnetohydrodynamic structures. But what he sees outside of this plastic and then aluminium or whatever container, not I'm not talking about the strange radiation or the magnetic monopoles that they observed, I'm talking about above the reactor they produced a ball lightning and a few milliseconds later that decayed into loads of micro ball lightning. So whatever was making the ball lightning had something similar uh, as a self-similar structure. So I've talked about this um, in, for instance, my um, Lenner in a Can presentation in uh, Azizi a few years back. And you can go and look that up. But I will give the links in the um, video present, uh, the, the blog for this video. Anyway, so... Um, what I'm suggesting potentially is that this boundary here has things that are coming in and it's self-organizing such that the outside is 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 kind of like the same kind of structures as the thing that's in in the core. These things seem to be attracted to each other but not affected by electric or magnetic fields. Um, okay, so um, this for me is absolutely critical data so what i was talking about earlier is uh, this area down here under the sem actually has a, a toroidal ball lightning type structure a small one uh with that same kind of thick um double layer iron then with these twisted pairs coming off at regular intervals so i won't go into that but i will show it in in the blog because i, I didn't get a chance to prepare that today but what i want to talk about is that on the periphery we have these two three four five six and eight and there were multiple examples if you go and look at the live video recording here and so the, the first thing i want to address is the structure of um the o uh, where i i want to make a public revision uh, or rather it's, it's an adjustment 
to something which I have been not perfectly certain of since I very first did it. But I think today um, we can understand probably where the double layer comes from and how that needs to be accounted for. Um, and so I'm going to just just uh, assemble something here in a mi minute. I will do. Uh, and then you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, this might work. And I want to do uh, that. Okay. So, um, here is the basic structure, uh, the 3D structure. I'll put that to perspective so you can see it. And I've got the the sacred geometry basic 2d construction lines in there as well okay um i haven't got the cones in there so maybe i should put the cones in there have i got the yin cones or the cones there okay so um where the disruption beam it comes out it bleeds out when it interacts with the tor on the fractal level above the minus one fractal level okay and we've seen these in we see these in spiral galaxies we see these in um the uh lion reactors we see this in the ultra experiment okay so i'll go back to the top side here uh, and what i want to do is show that i'm gonna do the whole structure fractally rather than just a sub part of the fract uh, the structure here and that's like this so if i could now go to perspective here um you know, perspective what i've done is i've got the sphere the non-radiating boundary of the fractal structure so if i take the main tour and i just put that into the background here that might be a little clearer for you guys okay so I've actually got the whole uh, structure with its non-radiating boundary. Now, when I go to the um, this structure here, what I see is something that, um, you know, I've talked for a long time that the non-radiating boundary is either here where the Sothic Triangle intersects or it is here on um, the sort of uh, this sphere but centered in the, how should we put this, the Maltese Cross, the Christ Center, okay? And what I'm saying is it is possibly both, is that this here might be the double layer area but when you look at the subfractal, the n minus one in this instance, you can see that it isn't compliant uh, unless it goes out there with the um, substructure in the sacred geometry. So therefore, the double layer must at least have the outer bounds at this point. I haven't corrected the 3D geometry in this. And so you will see that in the examples I give, this sphere does not meet perfectly in the center. So I just to take out the main tour here, and you'll see what I'm talking about, there's actually a gap here, okay? And what should happen is that this sphere meets here and should meet here, okay? So you'll have to, with what I'm going to show you today, uh, hold that in mind when we are going through the... Um, various n minus one structures okay all right 
Uh, thank you, above all things, love, and thank you for your contributions, and thank you, DIY Projects with Chouncis. That's very, very much appreciated. Okay, so, back to the presentation. All right, so, this isn't exhaustive. Um, in fact, if I can find it, I'm going to bring up Leclerc's slides, which I had earlier today somewhere. <laughs> I don't know where they are. Uh, where are they? So Leclerc did a lot of cavitation work. Uh, you may be aware or not. Um, and uh, maybe I can just find it again. Let me just do that. Uh, uh, uh. Oh, maybe I'll find it. I'll find it later. But basically, Leclerc observed different holes in his cavitation with even triangular holes and square holes and uh, uh, hexagonal holes. Uh, if I can find it. If I can't, then I'll just um, uh, show it at another time <laughs> in my blog. <laughs> All right. Um, oh, no, I've got it here. This is it? Yes, okay, I can, I can do it here. This is good. All right. So, Lecaire did a huge amount of work on cavitation. Ultimately, uh, when I referenced his work in recent years, uh, my referencing of him was uh, mocked and derided by a guy who works for the U.S. Navy and is, uh, in 1990 was given the job of um, safety in nuclear research. So he went and said, no, he went to the Navy and we didn't see anything. And it's like, well, OK, fine. All right. So here we've got possibly a pentagonal hole uh, in the material. Here we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, maybe. This one's one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, this one's one. That's the one we've just seen. And here we've got a triangular uh, impact mark, a triangular impact mark. So... You know, he saw these kind of things and he assumed it was this kind of like water crystal thing. Um, but that's okay, uh, you know. But I wanted to show this because, like, it's not only us that have seen uh, triangular structures and hexagonal structures, but a lot of the time it's either hexagonal or pentagonal, like the um, inside of the outside of the thunderstorm generator. Very, very many hexagonal or pentagonal structures. Some octagonal, but almost all hexagonal or pentagonal. I think maybe today we will possibly have a hypothesis for why that occurs. Okay, so first up is this. And so here is the um, work that I was showing you earlier. A clip from that, which is from this cavitation work of Metin R, Bubble Structures in Acoustic Cavitation. Um, and so uh, that is that. So this is a 2-1, and these are the disruption beams that come out. So I would argue that these exist in the Great Pyramid of Egypt as well, and they would be able to uh, pull and push energy around the planet uh, that was being, um, you know, influenced by this uh, etheric matter uh, technological interaction device called the Great Pyramid. Anyway, so um, we have shown that the Aarhus University's actual coherent matter topological monopole is better represented by our model than their theoretical mathematical prediction of what it should look like because it has this f shape which is conformant to the um what would be output from this so essentially we showed that in cavitation in uh Roy Shinamaza's steel plates and here and in the work of Binjuen Huang in in the work of the ultra experiments and so forth 
that everything kind of aligns and we have this non-radiating boundary and stuff that is able to chop material up. But here in the work of Henk Uren on the outside of that cut area, we have a two structure and you have this kind of like uh, quote mark where the um, vortex is coming in. And I have described this as being like this on this water spout, this same kind of structure is going on is effectively the same as what's going on in here and I am arguing that this is because of the interaction beam uh, and the vorticity it presents on the ether the torsion field that it presents on the ether that bleeds out of this non-radiating boundary okay and if we go to the n minus one at three you can see that this still exists, that the uh, the sophic triangle, the interaction area, but more more than that, principally, the disruption zone, which is the point at which the tor level above interacts with this torsional beam, um, this spread beam at the sophic triangle angle. When you have three, you still get this quote mark coming in yeah all right this up here is uh, so this is in a plasma reactor of Henk Uren and this is a triangle pit and a triangle pit and in the corner of these triangle pits there's little spherical or or kind of like two kind of spot structures in these corners and so I think they would be synthesized in uh, a, a toroidal structure in each of the corners here and it would be arranged something like you are seeing here so that would be there and there would be the the yin or the yang either side and that would be creating the overall fractal structure that's doing these two triangular holes so this i believe is equivalent to what we just saw with the leclerc work and um and, and in fact what you have here is the omega and the alpha with the bit that comes down so it's the alpha and omega um, in the actual structure it's, it's all embedded okay now when you get to four so notice that the disruption zone this area in Tesla's Wardenclyffe Tower where the secondary takeoff and he says that if you move this just a little bit down it'll create a ball of light which is fantastically destructive and destruct the, destroy the apparatus in his 1914 pattern I'm paraphrasing it something like that okay this is a very critical point um, both in our observed experiments and in his 1914 Wardenclyffe Tower, which is exactly the structure. It's not slightly the structure, it's exactly the structure. There's no shadow of a doubt that is exactly what this structure is. So if we go to the fourth order, so this would be effectively a swastika, a auspicious symbol, and you've got your square hole, and inside of that, you've got a square, square hole, right? <laughs> Go figure. Here, you start to lose the vorticity. Now, why? I argue. The reason is, now, bearing in mind what I told you, these non-radiating boundaries should be slightly larger. And if they were slightly larger, you would notice that the center of the disruption point actually is on the non-radiating boundary of the next fractal toroidal structure in the overall n minus one levels of the overall fractal toroidal structure so what this means is is that rather than bleeding out as it does here and as it does here it's not bleeding out the disruption is is basically either if, if it's a a yang it's feeding into the next one or if it's a yin it, it's it's pulling from the previous one okay and this makes it a stable structure which for me indicates that the swastik is the first stable structure of the kind of fractal toroidal structure now by by that I mean it doesn't have this kind of wobble that bleeds out it doesn't have this kind of wobble that bleeds out that ends up having this torsion beam that comes out. It's it's far more stable 
than three or two, okay? And this might be why it's it's something that is considered, you know, very good uh, and balanced, okay? Of course, when you get to five, this is when it really is well inside. In fact, here you can see part of the Sothic triangle is actually outside. So almost like a, a, a good chunk of it is outside. Yeah? Uh, in the three and the two, all of it is outside. The, and the, the next n minus one. When you get to four, part of it's inside, but when you get to five, all of the Sothic triangle is inside the non-radiating boundary of the adjacent structure. Okay? All of it. Now, what it isn't inside is the apple. And we know that, you know, uh, these things can wet together. The non-radiating boundary of these things can wet together. And you see this in the sapphire tufts. When the tufts get too big, they start, and you can see it in the work of Henk Urin, uh, you can see that, you know, when the non-radiating boundary gets too large, then these wet together. Okay? But the internal structure here, the actual apple of the structure, um, the what they call, a, is it a horn torus? Or no, it's a spindle torus, what they call a spindle torus. It's not inside there. It's just starting to touch it, but it's not inside there. Certainly, the disruption area is not inside there. However, one would argue that 5 is far, far more stable than 4. Okay? 5 is far more stable than 4. And you can actually see... In this instance, when you get to five, it starts to be like, you know, it starts to get a little bit round, okay? Anyway, it's when you get to six that I think you'll see something that is frankly astounding. This, my friends, is a boom! Can you see it? Can you see what I'm looking at? Can you see what I am looking at? Can you see what it is yet? <laughs> this, my friends, is a subunit of the flower of life. Yeah. Phase singularity... Yeah, you got it. You got it. And when I did this, I just thought, you're kidding me. You're literally kidding me. And it's I only complete it only was easy to see because I was using this old 3D package, which actually has recently been updated, has been bought out by the British company. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Um Of course there's a little hole in the middle which shouldn't be there. There should be no hole in the middle. It should be a singularity. And the reason it isn't is because I described earlier, I haven't quite got these non-radiating boundaries, the outside of the double layer, in exactly the correct place. But what you can see is in this instance, in this instance, my friends, the entire disruption zone, this dangerous area, according to Nikola Tesla, is within the apple. This makes it, in my view, extremely stable extremely stable okay so it is not surprising that hexagons as a structure in the form of graphene and in the form of graphite and and you know uh, these kind of incredible buckyball type of structures the four and five so that the the four uh the the, the f sorry the five and the the sorry the oh, I'm going backwards <laughs> wrong button green yeah <laughs> uh, it's not gonna what just go forward oh no it's not gonna let me go forward stop it right there the I'll try it again five and six 
The five and six are stable and extremely stable. Stable and extremely stable. Okay? Now, beyond that is the eight, which is the lucky eight, the auspicious eight of the Chinese. So we have our eight structure here. And in this instance, on the eight, I mean, it gets a little bit difficult to see, but you are completely, well, you're still completely inside the apple, but you're, the disruption zone, that this little spherical area is just outside, I mean, just outside the tour of the one next door. If you go beyond this, you end up uh, with an extremely tight structure because the the disruption beams basically feed directly into the structure above. Sorry, behind rather, in the overall thing. Now, just to clarify what that is, um, this is my Photoshop sacred geometry here. And uh, it's slightly, uh, you know, it's a bit rough what I did in Photoshop. But you can see how that is one subunit and that it's... Um, non-radiating boundary merges with the next one in order to create the flower of life. Now, um, this is a deep honor to share this with you. Um, it took, this was, a, like I say, October the 4th, 2014, sorry, 2018 rather, so it's taken a good few years to get to the point of being able to share that uh, with you. And I want to talk about a couple of other aspects of it. So what I'm imagining is that it's a subunit here. Okay. And that these mesh together. And they will have these torsional areas where um, effectively you get these twisted things coming out, like these twisted things coming out, these uh, twisted things coming out, these twisted things coming out, okay? And I would argue that that explains what we see both in the hydrodynamic one of uh, Suhas Ralkar from 2017 the influence of these things traveling across aluminium in ultra experiments, which I've shown before, and I'll list in the blog so you can know what I'm going on about. Um, and the um, ones coming out of uh, the fuzziness, so the fuzziness that is around here. And what do I mean by that? I'm going to go back into 3D here, and it's going to make it a little bit easier potentially for you to understand what I'm talking about. And then I'll go back in, I'll go into Photoshop. Um, and we will see what's what. Okay. Okay, so. Uh, yeah. All right, so this is the two uh, structure. Okay. And I'm going to get rid of the disruption beams because I don't have them for the other ones. So if we go to the three... And I'm going to get rid of the yin cones and I'm going to put in the main tour in the background and I'll get rid of the sacred geometry there because it's not so easy to see it. So, Okay, now if you can imagine that our flower of life, and I'm going to go to the six one here, our flower of life here, is meshed over a surface of a sphere and I'll attempt to show how that might occur, although, you know, there's a thing I need to resolve, which I'll talk about later. But the end level, if these are all pointing out the end level, they could be pulling matter in and feeding the ball lightning from these points of... Uh, um, all over the surface. So it feeds the structure. And... When the structure blows up or gets destabilized, as it did in the word work or 2000, around uh, circa 2000 of Leonid Oritskiev, then because this is self-similar, the subunits of the large ball lightning 
would actually be little micro ball lightning. And if these broke up, they would be micro micro ball lightning, as we saw converting oxygen on copper oxide to sulfur in the Amasa gas on 10 yen coin. So you can sort of start, of un start to understand how it's fractal. And, you know, so you might argue that the actual non-radiating boundary here is this flower of life structure, but at a different quanta on the outside. It's, it's just a bit weird to kind of think about it. So at some point, you've got to simplify it for, for visual, uh, you know, ability to see it visually. But I believe that what's coming out of the center here is these twisted braided things, these filaments that fly around and they account for the fuzziness that you see on the outside and also the kind of potentially the crenellations that you see on the outside of these uh, hollow spheres. Okay. All right. I'm just going to show this from, I think, the bottom. No, no, not the bottom, the back, on the back and the front. So you can see if we look at it from the back here, you see this is the central spot here of the disruption zone. And so it just nicely lines up there. Okay. And if I go to the front, you can see a bit clearer the kind of um, flower of life. I'm going to turn off the main tour here so you can see it a bit clearer. Okay. Now I'm going to go to Photoshop now. Uh, and overlay it over that um, Scandinavian artifact. I think it's from the 14th century. So what am I referring to? I'm referring to the opening slide here. And I have to thank, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm going to have to credit him in the blog, but someone pointed this out to me uh, during the week, this beautiful piece of silver treasure. And we're going to look at that in Photoshop. Uh, honest. Hopefully. <laughs> is it going to work? Okay, all right. So here is our six N minus one structure. And like I say, the center here should completely meet. There should be no gap in the middle there. Okay. Anyway, for the sake of argument. This is our piece of treasure. And I'll note you a couple of things. One, it actually has kind of like a double layer here. Right? Uh, it obviously has these nodes. And the nodes you'll see are actually the magnetic cores of each of the fractal toroidal structures, okay? Um, and this would be the overall core, but orthogonal to it, yeah? Um, so if I overlay the two, you'll see here how, how that kind of works. So each one of these has the core in it, the core in it, the core in it, the core in it, and so forth um, and then it actually lines up with the collective circles and as I told you the sorry the uh, non-radiating boundaries of the n minus one tour but as I told you these things wet together so this would actually be more like a, a sphere itself even though it's made up of uh, these kind of substructures the, these kind of would wet into each other they wet into each other so they don't end up being quite so like this now, um, I have another image of it. Is it this one? Uh, no, it's a different one here. It's just, you can see actually the scale here of this artifact. And so I've got it lined up there. All right. Now, I just did a quick attempt to, you know, roll the kind of like another patch. And this is where I need some th extra thinking to resolve the complication here is that, you know, effectively, you would think that the flux is going around this way. And if we put another one in here to add our next patch, um, you kind of have to mirror that. So it's it's going like in alternate directions. 
And if you look at the work of Bitchkoff, he talks about these these kind of cogs that come together. But of course, if you put another one up here, you know, which way does it go? So it's it might be that these things are kind of like they're slightly twisted in the way that they um, orient themselves so that they can patch together. What I will note, though, is that if you go to the this area here, this is a very classic um, structure you see in church architecture. Okay? All right? Very, very classic. And I will actually show you a World Heritage Site that is entirely built on this particular uh, shape. Okay? It's like the, the, the bishop's headdress type thing. Now, if I overlay this structure here, there is a triple overlaid vortex here. If I take the two out here, you'll see the triple overlaid vortex. Okay? And that exactly matches this section here in between, uh, in the center of this structure. Okay? I don't know how these ancient peoples knew this. And I will talk about much, much more ancient stuff that also links to this. But this is probably enough uh, for today um, in terms of explaining what I wanted to explain many, many moons ago. And that is the spherical structure of ball lightning and how this self-similar stru structure can break up into smaller and smaller subquanta that themselves are effectively like ball lightning. Okay. So, uh, uh, with that, uh, I want to ask if there's any questions. Um, so, I'll see if there are any questions and we'll see. <laughs> um, uh, it's been a, a real, real honor to be able to share this with you today. It's been a long time coming and I'm sorry for that. Um, and, you know, when I when I shared the, the fractal structure here, um, maybe it's going to show me it. Uh, this fractal structure, I hoped that someone <laughs> at some point would do the job for me and extend it beyond this into uh, these kind of structures and see what was essentially kind of emerging in my mind to explain these kind of things that that we see physically in experimentation and that the ancient people knew and obviously this is not new because it is here as well okay so um and do we have any questions okay so um the first question is Terran Art for windex update um i think probably it would be best to do that in a separate session um uh, tony yaboni had some issues and has got a new job and so you know um uh we can talk about where things are yes there's updates but let me do that in a separate one so the tours next to each other create a hyper a hyper trochoid and vertical pisces um okay if there's those are the names i don't know what these things are but great kb thank you for that um <laughs> so DIY projects with chalks this is obviously suffering the flood in Victoria in Australia so sorry for that so uh, Toon Peter says my question is can I get more characters to write a question with um no I don't think you can I, I get the same kind of number of characters as you uh, you can obviously write a lot of characters in remote view to ICU and you can write a lot of characters in um uh what do you call it uh the questions and comments in YouTube. So there. Um, right, Visa Capices. Yes, the Visa Capices is kind of basically everywhere in this structure. But what I'm saying today is that when you have these overall circles formed of six, what you get in the center is actually th these kind of things are orthogonal. Okay, so there's like alternate ones. But it's it's... It, I mean, it's it's just a thing of great beauty. It really is. Um, breaking it down. Um, so Corky's got 18 inches of snow. Uh, yes, it's getting super cold here as well. 
very cold. Hi, Freya in Hella Black. Hi, Screwdriver Tuning. Cathedral churches as oxygen generators using water-based frequencies. I would certainly say that, um, and I've talked about this, that churches and cathedrals are based on the same um, solid-state etheric engineering technology as the uh, Great Pyramid of Giza. And depending on where the font is in the... Um, church or cathedral it in my view will have the oxygen in the water um, charged with chi energy life force and so it's very appropriate that that you know baptism occurs in that place um, how to build a flying saucer with this knowledge we well elva lohu i have discussed that in the past i think that um Essentially, the 48 divisions that we have um, here are the same 48 divisions that are on the ARV. And I've explained kind of how that works. It's probably, I could probably do a special on that at some point. Um, I described it in a meeting uh, with alien scientists, uh, his kind of Christmas meeting. So you can go and have my discussion. Uh, short discussion on that. Uh, yes, uh, Ret Oracle, literally holy water. <laughs> so, uh, G, the skater. Hey, Bob, I'm so happy I finally caught a stream. Cheers. It's a pleasure to have you here. Um, I'm sorry you didn't catch one in the past, but that's, uh, you know, thank you for joining the club. Um, Corky Gus, cloud busting intentions sent. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> I don't think he needs any cloud busts. <laughs> cloud busting right now, Corky. He needs the opposite. Uh, by the way, it seems NJ is very near uh, where I live and I wish to meet them sometime. I'd love to work with them. Well, that would be great. Yeah, why not? Go for it. Um, uh, KB says, definitely a beautiful thing. Also, the cathedral and star forts and uh, megalithic sites, I believe, work similarly to Wardenclyffe and worked in concert. Well, uh, you know, I wasn't surprised to find out that Nikola Tesla was obsessed with the Great Pyramid of Giza and certainly his 1935 or whenever it is photo to, or to um, promote the weapon to end all wars, that staged photo in the New York Times is absolutely showing 100%. He knew that the sacred geometry was the key and magnetohydrodynamic vortices were the key. Absolutely, 100%, he knew that. Uh, the ancients definitely knew what was going on. Yes, they had swastikas everywhere. It's like the auspicious symbol, but like for the Chinese and, and so forth, it, it's the auspicious eight. Um, so, and I will talk about that. I have some amazing images from the National Taipei Palace Museum of some of the treasures of the former royal family of China. And it's absolutely clear, absolutely clear what... And, and some of the artifacts, the buy discs I'll go into the buy discs in a separate presentation, but it's absolutely clear to me that they are representations of this understanding and they were in neolithic burials like they, they were pre-buddhism so you know really really um they understood this uh someone understood it uh so um okay so Toon Peter says, Bob, I found a recipe on the Parkamov reactions tables with the first six products, no noble metals. Okay, great. Well, let me know. <laughs> um, who here has looked at Sam, the structured atomic model? Yeah, it's a very nice model. Um, they don't include the neutrino, um, although, you know, if you look at... Um, the work of Kovacs. Um, he suggests that the there's a heavier electron in the uh, a nuclear electron is heavier. Okay. G G the skater. Uh, Bob, here's also a crazy theory I had. Do Muslim people wear hijabs because the pyramids charged the ground so much that it made I, I think they wear them because it's sunny. 
and it stops them getting damaged. <laughs> and you get sandstorms, and it's useful to have it on when you've got a sandstorm, right? Um, yeah. Uh, blah, blah, blah. What are your thoughts on Alexander Parkamov taking an interest in the Taiwan paper? Well, to be fair, uh, the Taiwan research would not have happened in the way it did had it not been for Dr. Alexander Parkamov sharing valid outputs from um, nuclear interactions that we then, as an MFMP, I, I designed a system in which Philip Power in Australia, a nuclear physicist, programmed so at um, nanosoft.co.nz, and it was on the basis of um, testing potential reactions that could have occurred that led to the paper effectively that is published in uh, the journal. Uh, I will do a separate video probably during the week on that. Um, you know, it's a, it's a little interesting to see how much effort a very few people are doing to try and discredit the work. But uh, frankly, you know, <laughs> excess heat has been shown since the Schaefer patents in ca cavitation, I think since 1973, and the Kladov patents from 1980s. And, you know, many people have seen the transmutation uh, and uh, commensurate with excess heat, for, in for instance, Leclerc, with a COP of 3.45 or something, and wide-scale transmutation. So, um, you know, what this is, is the first systematic study of specific transmutations only present when very, very sizable excess heat is present. So he's had much higher COPs, but the reactors failed. So he dialed it back and he's got like regularly 1.6. And so if you've got an average input of 8 kilowatts and you're getting up to 1.6 COP, that is 4.8 kilowatts of excess heat. This isn't milliwatts like Pons and Fleischmann. This isn't watts like our replication of Chelani. This is kilowatts. It's very easy to observe kilowatts. And when you get the kilowatts, you get the gases that are non-condensable observed by the third party gas and, and mass spectrometer uh, company that does the analysis for the Taiwan semiconductor industry using the same gas collection technology and the same analysis te techniques, you do not see those excess gases or those non-condensed gases, those uh, purportedly or seemingly synthesized gases rather, um, when you do not see the excess heat. So this is excess heat and commensurate with these synthesized gases. No excess heat of 4.8 kilowatts <laughs> and uh you know so in my view it's kind of like okay all right well you, you know why whinge and wine um but they are laser focused on delivering this and i will actually talk about in a presentation where they intend to deliver the first commercial test plant and it's a spectacular ambition and it, you will be in no doubt that they are incredibly serious and i have to say quite honestly Taiwan is incredibly beautiful. If you've never been there, it's basically a load of mountains. You know, some there's one mountain, it's over 4,000 meters high. It's basically a mountain range covered with forest. And then on the edge, there's some big cities, three, three, three cities. But basically, it was a very agrarian society that in 30 years became the world supplier of the best semiconductors. And if the West... And its attitude towards promoting and being positive towards and supporting um, the work of researchers in the field of what I refer to coherent matter nuclear reactions, uh, toroidal moment induced reactions, ball lightning reactions. If they're not supportive of that, I think the world's going to be dependent on Taiwan for the next generation of energy. So if they control the world's best energy and the world's best semiconductors, and it's just a population of like 
less than 30 million people. It's a joke. It's really embarrassing the attitude of some individuals in the West towards this research. Cavitation with excess heat and transmutation has a very, very long history in the term in you know this field. Okay. Essentially before Pons and Fleischmann, there were already devices producing excess heat <laughs> using cavitation. So um uh it is it yeah, I mean it's it to me it's just like <sighs> come on, like seriously, are we gonna be falling behind in this as well? And like anyway, it's it's a little bit sad. <laughs> Yes, FPV Angel, this is manipulating the ether. It is ether engineering. Toon Peters, try boron and bismuth in the two to two reaction table. 41% of the energy in the results table is in the top six products. Osmium, iridium, platinum, uh, uh, gold. Uh, you've got platinum twice and platinum again yes okay lots of platinum <laughs> all right well everyone would like to create cr precious metals um i uh, you know what i find is it takes precious metals typically and it makes um non-precious metals out of them so you know i i would like to you know now i've helped bin and and i felt uh, um malcolm and the thunderstorm generator i would like to try and see if what I can do um, with Fukushima uh, moving forward. But I think it's about time we do a systematic study on ultra experiments because that is very, very easy and cost effective for people to replicate. <laughs> Glitch. No, I'm not saying you won't be able to create precious metals. We certainly seem to be able to create some. Um... But yeah, you know, you've got to be careful because if you push it too hard, like like Leclerc, you end up creating transuranics and then they decay and you get normal radiation and that's no fun. Yeah, ball lightning is is coherent matter. It's more in and superconducting st uh, structures. It's it's not just plasma. Pl plasma isn't necessarily superconducting. In fact, there's a lot of reasons to say why plasma wouldn't be superconducting a lot of the time. Um. If flying saucers are built on these principles, do they admit... Well, El Elva Loho, right? Tesla's Wardenclyffe patent was awarded in 1914. In 1911, in The Sun, New York, he said, using these principles, one might fashion a flying machine um, uh, hitherto unseen with something like this, I'm paraphrasing, uh, with no screw propellers or control surfaces, uh, it can be any size, any weight, and fly at fantastic speeds in any, basically any kind of weather conditions. So, um, yes, 100%, um, this is the technology, in my view, that would allow flying machines. Um, and even flying machines that have literally no, you know, you can synthesize them at a distance and move them around by similar mechanisms to which you synthesize them and then you use them to aggregate into larger self-similar structures uh so you know the way you would detect these devices is using uh something like a laser interferometer like a gravity wave device um but i've described in my ICCF 25 presentation how you would use anything that's based on the Josephson uh, um, junction type thing where you it can detect these phase changes that are necessary when you are altering the um, fractal toroidal moment you'll end up with these Aronhoff bomb effect and this um, um, phase changing uh, going on which can be detected by qubits and any of these things that are kind of related to um, uh, a Josephson junction 
Uh, Bob, are the two, three, four, five, six section tours locked into their respective tour levels or can they upgrade? Um, I think you pump them more energy and they kind of like, if you can imagine that a sub-sub tour, like an N-2 tour, can carry multiple subunits up to 48, what it might be is that you know, they, they, they pump themselves, they, they can have a minimum of two and a maximum, let's say, of 48. It might be more, but I think it's 48, right? Based on, you know, the ARV and based on the Stele from, from Samaria and so on. There's, there's multiple reasons why that is. And then when they get to, like, 48 and they're pushed a little bit harder, they then subdivide almost ex instantaneously into, let's say, from a... A three n minus one with each of the n minus ones with forty eight n minus twos. They reorganize into something that then would would have you know a swastik type arrangement and then and so forth. So they they basically self organize up into uh, d the different quanta. Um, because these interact with the contra conscious field and the the a sentient being like a human does as well, it's natural to consider that the best way to interact with these things is through consciousness. And you would want to find a way to directly connect in that way. So the juggler's assistant says, I've got two rainbows, one on either side of me. It's so romantic to think of them that way. <laughs> yes, I guess it is. William Schwant, nice to have you here. I can imagine this in my head as you say it. Uh, this is the best research ever. That's very kind of you to say. Uh, it's been a deep honour to be... For those that have been here since the, the beginning, I, I, I kind of... I, I I was suffering, not I wouldn't say suffering, I was having these dreams from a very early pre-tens that I had to do something in my 40s and basically the project was started on my just after my 40th birthday and, and I mostly am where we are today um, before my 50th birthday but it, it's taken a very long time to step by step get the right evidence that is repeatable in order to demonstrate that the ancient and, and I didn't ever expect the ancient people to have known this but it very very quickly became clear when you saw the physical evidence that somehow the ancient people had seen the same physical evidence and that they had come up with what you see on the screen here the, 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 with the flower of life here and this and and as as I showed you in Photoshop uh, not with this image, <laughs> but uh, with this image. Somehow, uh, they had worked this out. 100%. Johnny 40, I still own my gold, Bob. Well done. <laughs> Especially at the today's price. <laughs> So, uh, Tomb Peters asks um, when I'll be working with Ben Van uh, Quirkwick, uh, doing looking at the vases. We had some um, emails exchanged uh, whilst I was in Taiwan, and we are going to talk at some point about the vases. However, um, I just have not had the time. It's been insane. Um, so, you know... Um, one step at a time. Um, we we are going to connect. Gordon Doherty says one of Tesla's party tricks was to rest one hand on 
uh, an ether terminal and hold an iron bar in the other and the iron bar melted with no damage done to tesla um gordon i think we're going to try and replicate that experiment and it's going to be a lot of fun more on that later i mean much later in the year there's a lot of things to do before then So Glenn Norberg, me, he, uh, he says, I'm new here as per MH370. Are the orbs physical manufactured things? I do not believe they are. No. Using magnets or lasers? Uh, they are, in my view, as I have said before, you take a phase conjugated electromagnetic wave at 180 degrees out of phase. So you, you beam the same frequency and you beam the same frequency again, but 180 degrees out of phase. This creates compression and and uh, um, expansion, rare refraction, uh, at the nodes. Uh, the whole thing sums to zero, but at the nodes, you get this compression and alternately uh, rare refraction. And this leads to uh, effectively uh, scalar waves. And then you take two of these beams like for instance from ground stations or from from satellites and you cross the beams and that that is called um interferometry and at the crossing points of the interferometry uh you can essentially energize a point in space time and uh, build these structures and then you manipulate them with the crossed beams as it were something along those lines and, and most of this was described by um Tom Bearden and because they have a gravitational azimuth that goes through the core this flux of chi this flux of relic neutrinos in my view um, when you you can orient them um, but when you orient them so that the flux is linked together it creates a new fractal tor above so for instance if I was to give the example from my presentation uh, what we are looking at here is uh, the three here and so um, what is happening you get the three it has its gravitational azimuth that goes through the center and then that links up with that one links up with that one and it creates a new gravitational azimuth through the center here and you can see how it's made this bit disappear <laughs> the material has disappeared in the center here right it's disappeared in the center here okay um, so uh, that is effectively how it works and then the overall structure now can be moved around by interferometry um, in the same way that the substructures were. So Shockwave says, Bob, ancients didn't know the secret. They just played with geometric patterns. They probably no, I don't think that's true. Shockwave, I, um, this is the science of, in my view, the structure of the physical universe and how it manipulated, how it self-organizes, how matter is formed and reformed and born and dies. Um, that is condensed matter in the form of baryonic matter. Um, how it's raveled and un and unraveled, and um, there's no doubt in my mind that any sentient being paying attention long enough to nature around them will discover the wheel within a wheel within a wheel, and they will discover the fractal nature of the overall sacred geometry structure, um, uh, and that is the basic sacred geometry structure is here in 2D and he's here in 3D and that stable ones occur from the swastik upwards and the most stable ones are the 5 and 6 which are what you see in buckyballs and uh, uh, the 6 itself is um, the subunit of the um, 
flower of life in my view like i say there's a couple of issues to resolve i will remodel these 3d ge geometries to get better um registration uh and you know the, the the chinese have their they like the auspicious eight and you know if you push it beyond here it just kind of wraps itself and the the matter starts to condense really <laughs> seriously um so like you might six six is good uh, three is the only what you need necessary technologically for because uh, three points define a plane so you can use this technologically to capture something and then move it move it around in my view Um, Carmen Miller, there's there's one thing your father is correct about, which I agree with, is that uh, water cavitation produces gravity and anti-gravity waves. Um, I totally agree with that. I don't know much else clear that I can understand, but at least that point I would agree with. So talking about things that I'm going to be looking at, I have these samples from Bin Zhuan Huang. And unfortunately, the, the, the I have a quite a large chunk of this material here, uh, which is called scale <laughs> from inside the high heat generating device. So this is from the 9th of August, 2021. So I am, I'm going to take part of the sample and do a magnetic test on it. I don't want to magnetize if there are magnetic particles in here too much of it. So I will do a video of me attempting to do that this week. And I will also, before I do that, I will sit this on the uh, radio code and I will look to see if it's outputting any um, gamma spectra or x-rays. So we will see that. I don't expect much because the cavitation material from um from uh Suhas Ralkar was only really active producing strange radiation for three or four months although I suspect that if I put it in sunlight I would be able to re-energize the the exotic vacuum objects that are trapped in the metals and maybe that's an option to do with this material from Bin Zhuen Huang but I'm quite excited to get this under an SEM and see if we have any of these uh, calcium spheres i don't know how he collected this did he scrape it off was it just aggregated in the, a trap somewhere i don't know and then i have some other samples here of the collapsed pipes and stuff and so i'm you know these it's a real honor to have these to look at and investigate Okay, so um, very briefly, I just want to go through this, um, what we talked about today. It is the seventh day of this beautiful year ahead of us, 2024, and this was Ode Flower of Life, and the photo there by Arlen Krista, quite appropriate name. And back on the 4th of October 2018, I shared one third of the original Ode slide deck. And this was a key part of that, the fleur de, uh, flower of life at the Temple of Osiris in, at Abydos, Egypt. And this beautiful 3D version of the flower of life, in my opinion, um, that is under the right foot of the Foo Dog in the central temple in the... Forbidden Palace in Beijing. I had the pleasure of seeing this 33 years ago after being on a train for 33 hours. And we derived 
some moons ago, on the 17th of February 2020, nearly four years ago, the wheel within a wheel within a wheel, the basic fractal structure. And from the other experimentation, we realized that this was a magnetohydrodynamic effect, and it works scale invariant and system invariant over various different technologies and that it is the basis at the very bare minimum of yin yang and within every yin yang there's at least a yin yang so within the yang there's a yin and a yang and within the yin there's a yin and a yang and that it has the caduceus it has the vortex spiral that comes out that depressurizes or pressurizes and that it is in the form of the cavitation bubble. It has the omega and the alpha in it. So you have the omega and then the alpha with the bit that sticks down exactly as it is represented in the ancient Greek. So the, the alpha is like this bit with the bit that sticks down and the omega is basically that. Okay, The beginning and the end. And we showed the basic 3D structure, uh, and one of the ma materials we used to get that was uh, this bubble structure here, where you have uh, two, a yin and a yang, and uh, they have this particular form here. Uh, in this bubble structure, also by Metin R, you see from the center here, you get a, a, a spiral vortex thing coming out, and we saw that in the cavitation spot under polarized light something had come out and left a spiral track now the things we needed to explain were the crenellations on the surface of a hollow structure and if this triangle section had broken off we would see that this is coherent layer you see the same thing on a toroidal one and i will point this out in the blog maybe with a little video to link these with this video but um this actually has a spherical ball around it, but you can't see it. We're looking into the toroidal structure in the in the core. It's fed with its feed line. And when this flashes here, that is when it is breaking away and, and reforming. And it's so, so quick. It's literally, you see the flash, but then as soon as the flash is gone, there's another one already there. Okay. And when these hit the fused quartz of the anode sheath they leave these various clusters four uh, six multiple this one's more five maybe or no maybe it's six as well and in one particular example you can see the substructure and the fuzzy bit on the outside and I'm saying that the fuzzy bit is where the caduceus is coming out of the collective n level from the n minus one structures that are making it it's actually pointing out and I think you basically have like ones that are sucking material in to the coherent matter layer, the, the non-radiating boundary zone. So like I say, there's, there's some things that are not fully resolved in my head. They will occur uh, ultimately, um, but I think we're getting close to uh, a sort of coherent argument throughout all of the data set. So um, around this hemisphere we saw two three four five six and eight structures and i then went through a series of other examples of of two like the bubble structure here and i believe that's what's causing this structure in this water spout from 1969 from noah and essentially um it's because the disruption beams on the n minus one are not linking in to the other um, non-radiating boundary of the one in the uh, n loop the n minus one are not linking their disruption beams in so you definitely see it very clearly on the two you see it clearly on the three and you can see that the disruption beams would be coming out here so they're very clearly not there and you also saw this on the lion um, crust galaxies we had the, the 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 two and the three very very clear 
But by the time you get to the four, it's, you know, yes, there's a bit of a beam coming out here, but mostly this has not got the vortex so clear on the center. Okay, and it may be that just, just, just enough of the disruption zone is inside the non-radiating boundary of the one in the loop above. But when you get to the fifth level here, the entire Sothic triangle and the disruption um, part is in the non-radiating boundary of the one round the loop. And so it doesn't bleed out in the same way. And when you get to six, so this is one level of stability, when you get to six, it's actually within the apple part of the structure, the disruption zone. Okay. Of course, when you are at eight, over here, um, it's kind of like the, the whole um, Sothic triangle is within the apple. Uh, and the disruption zone is just outside the torus of the n minus one uh, in the ring and so this might be why the chinese fixated on the auspicious eight um but certainly i believe that in nature six is one of the most important structures there and then we tied that together with um how it appears in the um how should we put this the artifact from Scandinavia yeah there's a couple of photos of it very by by various parties and if we overlay that on the structure like that you see that the magnetic cores are represented by the circular disks and this is the magnetic core but orthogonal to these ones okay um, and then if you overlay another one you can start to get to see how the flower life comes together and there is this very specific structure that's often seen in uh, religious structures as are all of the different levels of these uh, structures that you see them in the three four five six they are often in cathedrals and in public buildings and stuff this particular triangular area here if we go is this three-sided vortex here and that is on each section here each section here has this uh, triple vortex structure okay and so there might be spiral things coming out of here as well, whether it's coming out of here or here, um, you know. That is effectively uh, what I have for you today. So thank you for tuning in to Oday Flower of Life. Uh, Bob, are the tours elastic or rigid? Reanderthal says the R we know elastic to a degree because you see sometimes like when they crash down on a surface there's some distortion so even in the collapsed wave functions where it's left the tour of tours in the Hank urine experiments and it's crashed onto a surface and the whole structure is broken up it's kind of like it's broken it's kind of like come out of coherence and it's left it slightly distorted on, on as it's crashed into the surface so yeah but I think when it's fully spun up, it will organize itself into the, a minimum energy structure, which will be the best it can get to spheres and, and, and tors. Uh, Mr. Greenia, Elva Loho says, Mr. Greenia, do you believe the time travel to be possible? If, in my view, you are able to create these structures big enough to sit inside of them, I would and have suggested a number of times that it will freeze time inside so relatively outside they will be proceeding in normal time and inside you're frozen and so if you're frozen for a thousand years and you come out you have traveled into the future 
I have been consistent and I do not know any way that you can go backwards in time with this. But it's relatively simple to relatively go forward in time. If you think, and I've argued that this flux of relic neutrinos allows for all processes to proceed, be that random, so-called random processes like uh, nuclear decay or cell division or communication between two uh, um, neurons or chemical reactions. So if you influence the way an electron can behave, if you stop the ability of an electron to interact in all of the ways that an electron can ordinarily interact, then you stop chemical reactions. So a fire will instantly stop, right? It will literally instantly stop. Thought will stop. Consciousness will stop. Aging will stop. So for you, time has stopped, right? Because the ability of the electrons to change, you know, cell divide, chemical reactions to allow communication in your body, chemical reactions to allow a disease to progress, all of these things will literally freeze. And when you're in that, you are in stasis. You're not frozen in stasis. The electrons in your body in pathogens in your body, in communication pathways in your body, in cell membrane interactions in your body, they just stop functioning, right? So it's literally like hitting the pause button. So the rest of the world outside carries on like normal, um, but you you are frozen in time. And then when the, the structure breaks down, it's like unpausing, yeah? So you can go effectively forward in time, in my view. Uh, William Schwann says it's not really time travel. Well, it is relatively for you. Okay, so I'm, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and read your comments um, and maybe answer them during the week in the blog. Um, I, like I say, I'm still half on somewhere between, well, Asian time, so I'm, it's a little bit difficult for me right now. Um, I have to recognize that this is uh, possibly the biggest stream we've ever had, so thank you for all of those that have joined us for the first time. It's really, really great. For those of the you that wanted to comment but couldn't note that you can't comment on a stream unless you've been registered for a, a minimum of three hours so um you, you know a subscriber for a minimum of three hours so if you want to be able to comment in the future and you weren't able to comment in the stream i'm sorry but that's what you have to do um uh thank you for um the super chats here uh from uh, above all things and DIY projects with Chowsis, especially since he was flooded out today there in Victoria in Australia. Um, so uh, very, very much appreciated. And um, I, um, I'm i looking forward to a very, very special year this year. There will be naysayers. The in attacks will be incoming. But you have helped the project um, do very very interesting science there's going to be a lot of desire to do more of that this year but also to collectively we've got together a package of peer-reviewed papers spanning many decades patents and um, historical cultural artifacts that clearly show there is a structure to the universe they knew about it in the past they used it in the past they, they knew that we could access it through consciousness as well. Um, it isn't magic, but it does things that have been given, you know, the term of being called magic. Um, but it is just science. 
Um, it is, in my view, the God's toolbox with a little g. And we are at the new dawn of an old age. So with that, I'll say, buenas noches, dobro noches, good night, buenas Sarah. Happy New Year.